Thank you all for joining us. I'm Ann Galloway, the editor of VT Digger, a statewide nonprofit news organization that serves Vermont. It's my distinct pleasure tonight to introduce you to John Sales, the CEO of the Vermont Food Bank. Thank you, John, for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be with us for the third in a series of FAQ live events held by VT Digger. We're all very concerned about Vermonters having enough food this winter. And we've reported recently that one in four Vermonters face food insecurity. Before we get started, I'd like to thank my Doherty, the digital editor for VT Digger, who's producing our live stream tonight, and thank the generous sponsor of the FAQ live series, Garnet Health. Garnet Health provides both rapid antigen and PCR COVID-19 testing for individuals and businesses seven days a week. Garnet also offers expanded testing, including flu AB for symptomatic clients. Schedule a test today at their new location next to Burlington International Airport by visiting www.garnet.care slash testing. John, I'm so glad you could join us tonight. Thank you for taking time out of your incredibly busy schedule to be with us. Well, I'm really happy to be here, Anne. And, you know, it's it's a big part of my job to talk to people and answer their questions and make sure that people know what's happening. Well, there certainly has been an awful lot happening with food insecurity this year. Um, and all of it's been caused by this pandemic, which we're all trying to muscle through. Um, and uh, I wondered if you could kind of set the stage for us, you know, how is this crisis different from the one that we experienced with the great recession? What kinds of trends are you seeing? Is this um, going to really impact people differently this winter? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it is profoundly different than what we experienced in 2007, 2008, and really through, you know, 2013, 14. Um, we have not experienced, um, I think, across the country, uh, a, a food security issue, a hunger issue like this, really in a generation. Um, mm. it, is, um, it is deeper and wider than we've seen before. So, you know, to contrast it to the Great Recession, where we saw a huge spike um, when there were, there were some pretty in, um, intense job losses, huge spike in food insecurity and in people seeking food assistance and applying for programs like Three Squares Vermont, which is the nationally the SNAP program and used to be food stamps. Um, and then we expected that unemployment would remain high for a period of time and then go down. Um, and it also affected some people more than others. Um, there were certain certain types of, of industry and people with certain types of jobs that, that lost jobs and had them uh, lost them for longer. Now this, you know, COVID it, it's, it's basically shutting down large parts of the economy. Mm. Um, the, you know, the retail, the restaurant industry, hospitality industry in general. Um, in Vermont, I think at one point we saw 70,000 people applying for unemployment. Mm. Um, and it's not only the people who are unemployed, it's, it's um, older Vermonters who are justifiably scared to leave their homes. Um, you know, that are really susceptible to this um, and, and aren't getting out to, to go grocery shopping um, and are, are, are worried about people coming into their homes, bringing things or, or getting a ride somewhere. So, and we also expect, you know, the difference is that, that this is so, um, um, it, it's really hard to, um, to plan what's going to happen next. We just don't know what's going to happen. You know, we know how recessions work. We don't know how pandemics work. So th this could last for, you know, it could be over in six months, we thought, or it could be over in two years. Um, you know, we're, we're finding out more about that, but uh, the, kind of the up and down nature and the, the, the lack of understanding of how this is going to happen over the long run makes it much different. Mm. That uncertainty must be really difficult for people to experience, especially since, you know, you, we were talking earlier and you had mentioned that the federal government has played a role here. There have been some programs that have so supported people, but those are expiring soon. And I wondered if you could talk about that and, you know, when the benefits might be re-upped and, 
you know, whether there's going to be a gap um, that people are facing in between. So, yeah, there, you know, the, it was interesting. Um, I, I think it was March 15th when the governor signed the first executive order um, declaring an emergency. And, and we knew this was coming at the food bank and had been, had been planning and, and ramping things up. But, you know, when Congress passed, there were a number of, of coronavirus relief bills that passed. Um, and the first one had some additional resources for food banks and food. Um, and the, it was the second or third that, that had the PPP, um, the, the pay, payroll protection program um, to support businesses, the increase in unemployment benefits, the $600 boost, federal boost, um, and the $1,200 checks that went out to, to everyone um, over 18. And we had seen at the very beginning, this real surge in, in people who were, who were losing jobs and justifiably really concerned about the future, going to food shelves and meal sites. Uh, you may remember, uh, I think it was in, in April and May when we worked with the National Guard and FEMA and had Meals Ready to Eat MRE kits um, uh, provided to Vermont, trucked in here and distributed across the state because we were just worried that 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 people had an urgent, urgent need that we weren't going to be able to fill more quickly. And we did see that real boost in, in people looking for help. And then when those extra benefits, the $600 unemployment, the $1,200 checks, we actually saw a decrease in demand. We saw fewer people going to food shelves. Um, we saw um, just fewer, not any more increases in people going to the food bank run distributions around the state, which we call Veggie Van Gogh. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it's, it was easy to explain. People had money and they were able to go and shop for the food that they wanted and needed. Um, and then as over the, the two months after that, um, we really saw things slowly ramp up again. Um, during that time, we also saw the federal government um, institute what's called the Farmers to Families Food Box Program. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the folks watching this probably have, have read about that. Um, and it's, it's a program run by the USDA and the, the food bank is a partner. And we do daily distributions of a box of pre-packed fresh fruits and vegetables and dairy and meat products. We're doing right now 576 of those a day. And we do one a day in different locations all around the state. Um, and you have to make a reservation for that to pick up a box and the reservations are full at every distribution. Um, so so we've, seen, we've seen the need go back up again. Um, there's also now the Everyone Eats program, which people may have heard about where some of the CARES Act funding that came to Vermont was allocated and it's being used to pay for restaurants to continue operating and producing meals. And then those meals are being given away. Um, and that's been very popular and it's really exciting. I mean, people get these, these wonderful, uh, well-made meals at local restaurants. Um, the restaurants are required to use at least 10% of local foods in the food they're preparing. Um, and uh, and that's, that's, over the course of that program, it's gonna be about half a million meals that'll be distributed. The challenge, as you, as you mentioned, is that um, all this support goes away on December 31st. The CARES Act funding expires and actually any money that's not spent has to be returned to the federal government. Um, mm. So um, money that's come to the food bank actually from the state um, $4.7 million to, to purchase food, to make grants to your local food shelves and meal sites, um, and, and just pay for the operational expense of moving all that food. The Everyone Eats program, um, there's going to be, and have been actually a number of people in Vermont who have been losing their extended unemployment benefits. Mm. Um, so there's a real concern that, that come January, if if the federal government doesn't act again, um, that we're gonna see another surge in, in some pretty dire need, not just for food, but also for things, other basics like housing. Mm. Yes, it's, it's, uh, 
It feels like a double whammy, doesn't it? I mean, it at the end of the year, if people aren't able to get their unemployment benefits and some of these food programs, and it's really, it could be really painful. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Mike to queue up uh, one of our, a question from one of our readers. This question is from Hannah in Barrie. She asks, given that the level of food insecurity has increased with the pandemic, once the worst of COVID-19 passes, can we expect to see the numbers return to pre-pandemic numbers? Or do you expect to see residual challenges when it comes to food insecurity? Thanks, Hannah, for that question. Um, I think my answer is, is gonna be based somewhat on what happened back in the Great Recession also, which mm -hmm. is when the economy does start coming back, which, excuse me, eventually it will, um, what we find and what we found is that, that the, the folks who are relying on food assistance, a lot of them are kind of the last ones to come back. So these are people who maybe were working two or three jobs and lost, lost one of them and got hours reduced in the others. And they may be the last ones to really be hired back. Um, so there, I call hunger a leading and lagging indicator of a bad economy. So we generally start seeing an increase in need prior to something like the Great Recession. Um, uh, you know, COVID came on us so quickly that, that there really was no leading in, but there's going to be a lag. And uh, I'm expecting that would be, you know, 12 to 18 months past when, um, you know, when the, the newspaper headlines are everything's back. Um, mm. And so, so we're prepared, we're preparing for that. Um, and we expect to, to need to um, provide services above and beyond what we would normally expect to for quite a while to come. It sounds like from what you said, uh, John, that you're not sure that you can replace the kind of uh, mass feeding programs that the federal government uh, is efficient at at offering is is that true? I mean, you all are you're 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 you fill in the gaps. What happens when um, the federal government isn't there's a lag? You know, um, what what? How are you going to handle that? Yeah, you know that is true. We the the food the charitable food system was never set up to be a mass feeding program, and in fact, you know, as soon as COVID hit, we started talking to the state and and actually put together a, a mass feeding team that still is still meeting and making sure that the needs are being met. Um, you know, we brought in the, the National Guard and FEMA for MREs, Meals Ready to Eat, that were distributed in, I think it was in April and in May, um, because we knew that people had an immediate need and it was gonna take time to ramp other things up. Um, uh, that um, once, uh, once the federal um, resources go away, we're going to be doing everything we can to fill in that gap. And, you know, fortunately, um, the um, people in Vermont and really outside of Vermont, too, have been so um, generous and supportive that, that we'll have the ability to continue on at, at the current level um, mm -hmm. for, for some period of time, not a long time. And... Um, you know, we're still going to need resources, but the, the federal government needs to act. Um, this, this is just too big for, it's too big for a, a nonprofit organization. You know, and I would say this is too big really for the state of Vermont to address for, for people who live in Vermont. Um, mm -hmm. Just the, the three squares Vermont benefits, um, it's about $10 million a month. Uh, in normal times that are going to the, you know, uh, 60 or 70,000 people um, that are getting those benefits. Um, so, so we're just going to do the best we can. And, and also we'll be doing and are doing a lot of advocacy at the federal level, working with our congressional delegation, working with our national organization to, to um, help guide the federal government um, to make sure that the whatever they do is something that's really going to have an impact on the ground. 
Well, uh, we have another reader who's who has a question. Um, Evelyn from Woodbury. Ev from Woodbury asks, I believe this statistic, but please tell us how we know that one in four Vermonters is experiencing food insecurity. And please put that in human perspective, because we all need to be motivated to do something to help. Thanks, Ev. Um, good to hear from you. Uh, yeah, how do we know? Well, well, we actually know because we ask people. Um, there's there are a couple different surveys that that happen across Vermont. So, the 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 Census Bureau does actually a monthly survey, and the that that information feeds into the USDA and some of their economists. And the USDA is doing periodic surveys also. And so they put out data on the food insecurity levels. Um, in addition to that, um, the, the food bank um, with our national organization, Feeding America, is doing surveys also. And those numbers generally line up. Um, and we can also um, correlate those numbers to the number of people that are getting Three Squares Vermont benefits. So um, we'll see those numbers increase and decrease kind of in, in tandem with the numbers that that the food bank is looking at and Hunger Free Vermont, our, our fellow anti-hunger organization here. Also just recently, the, there's a consortium um, with some, some leading folks from the University of Vermont from the Gund Institute. Um, this was in the BT Digger story, they talked about this. Um, and they've actually been doing periodic surveys since March um, that have shown that it's actually more than one in four right now. We've seen since, since COVID began in mid-March, um, at least 30% of the people in Vermont have had the experience of food insecurity at one point. Um, and that doesn't mean, you know, that could be somebody who's, who lost their job for two months and then, and now they're back to work and things are okay. Um, but a lot, of, a lot of people are, are seeing continual um, issues. You know, I just want to point out food insecurity is really financial insecurity. Yeah. I mean, it's hard, it's harder to go to the grocery store now, but there's plenty of food there. So it's really just about people not having the financial resources to be able to buy the food that they want and they need. Yeah. Um, and Eva also asked about, you know, how do we kind of humanize this? And, uh, you know, one, one of the things I, Actually, if you look back to uh, the Amanda story that was in VT Digger, um, she talked to, to a woman named Amanda um, who had been homeless and uh, really knew what food insecurity was like. Um, and that is a common, common story. You know, people who, who for whatever reason um, find themselves in a position where they don't have a home, you are automatically food insecure. Um, but well beyond that, um, food insecurity can be, uh, for people in Vermont, um, just, uh, you know, eating ramen noodles three nights a week for dinner because you can't afford, um, fruits and vegetables and dairy and meat to put on your table. Um, it can mean, um, you know, buying hot dogs and macaroni and cheese for the kids um, while maybe the parents eat a bag of chips and a two liter bottle of soda, which is really cheap, but can fill you up enough to get you through the night. Um, mm -hmm. You know, what we find over and over again in talking to families and, and people showing up is that, that people will do anything to make sure that their kids are fed. Mm -hmm. um, and, and oftentimes we hear stories of, of parents who are skipping meals um, and are, um, you know, making sacrifices to make sure that their kids have, have the food that they need. Um, you know, if you go to our website, vtfoodbank.org, you can also uh, look at our blog and, and see a lot of stories of people um, working very hard and trying very hard. Um, and it's just tough these days to, to bring those ends together and, and have a roof over your head and make sure there's enough food on the table. Hmm. 
Well, for people who are hearing um, these stories, you know, we have a lot of readers who are concerned and they want to do their part. And Jean from Chelsea asks, you know, outside of financial assistance to the food bank, what can Vermonters do to help? Some of us have time and want to, but we don't know how. Uh, thanks and looking forward to hearing something spe specific, she says. Yeah. Well, there's, there's three things that I always talk about and they, they are very relevant today. Number one is of course, financial support. And thank you for, for recognizing that. And it's not just the food bank, it's also our local organization partners, the food shelves and meal sites and shelters all around the state. Um, there's also, there's still volunteer opportunities if you're willing and able to do that. Um, and I know these days it can be hard and I, you know, a lot of our volunteers over the years are, are older people um, and maybe people with underlying health conditions. And um, we had a lot of volunteers who said, I can't come anymore. Um, and that's, that's great. And we also have to keep our people healthy in our facilities. Um, the food bank is an essential employer and the work we're doing is critical. And so I have to make sure that, that the folks who work in the warehouses and the drivers and everyone who's doing the operations um, are, are staying healthy. Uh, but if, you, if you're interested in volunteering, actually you can go to, again, our website, vtfoodbank.org. Um, there are volunteer opportunities and it is more challenging right now to get volunteers. And there's volunteer opportunities all over the state. Um, not, we have facilities in Barrie and Rutland and in Brattleboro, um, but we do food distributions uh, with volunteer help in every region of the state. Um, so you can check our, our website or you can send an email to volunteer at vtfoodbank.org um, and get more information. And then the third thing is, is you can advocate. Um, so, you know, contact um, our senators and Representative Welch. Um, you know, they all are... They understand the issue of hunger, um, but it always helps to hear from constituents that they're concerned about it too. Mm. And also contact your, um, your local representatives um, in the Vermont House and Senate, and there was just an election, so there may be new ones, but um, oftentimes they're, they're closer to what's happening on the ground, but there are fewer resources. So when, uh, when your local representative hears from you that hunger is an issue that you care about, then when the food, Vermont Food Bank is before the legislature talking about um, programs that can help um, feed our neighbors, then they're more apt to prioritize that. Hmm. Well, that, that's, that's good to hear that people can uh, pitch in in many different ways. I mean, that's the great thing about Vermont. I think people really care and they want to do all they can to help their neighbors. So it's it's always um, comforting to read questions from readers for that reason. Um, and this one is from Peggy, who lives in White River Junction, and she says that her family of four qualifies for SNAP. However, the amount of SNAP or food stamp benefits that we get each month is nowhere close to the amount that our family needs for everyone to eat three healthy meals per day due to severe price increases since COVID-19 hit. To be able to eat three meals a day, we are eating stuff like ramen noodles and pasta, which is making our medical issues of diabetes and high blood pressure much worse. My husband and I were told we have to eat a lot less carbs and a lot more fresh lean protein, like fish and chicken. Do you have any tips or advice? We visit our local food shelves often, but usually only get more pasta, bread, and peanut butter and canned veggies because that is what is available. Yeah, that is a, you know, um, Ev was asking for stories and, and there's a reader coming in with their personal story. Yes. Um, first of all, I'd like to, to just say that um, I appreciate um, a family taking um, using three squares because again, it's not enough, but it is, it is really a sustainable resource for people. Um, one of the things, uh, a couple of things. First, um, during the pandemic, uh, families who were not receiving the maximum benefit um, got a boost 
So a family of four, um, if you know, most families have some income and so you're not necessarily getting the full benefit. And during the pandemic, they've increased. So every family is getting the full benefit um, as if they had the lowest income. Um, so there was a, a small boost there. It's still not enough. Um, and this has been a, a persistent issue um, a, and one that we've been advocating on um, you know, for as long as the food bank's been around is that, that the amount of SNAP benefits, which is three squares Vermont, um, needs to be increased. Um, it's actually based on what they call the thrifty food plan. Um, yeah. yeah, it's not the adequate food plan, it's the thrifty food plan. So um, there is actually the, the HEROES Act, I think it was called, which was the coronavirus relief bill passed by the US House that was never taken up by the Senate, mm. um, included a 15% increase in SNAP benefits. And uh, we strongly support that. and are advocating um, for this new Congress to, to take that up and to increase SNAP benefits by at least 15%. Um, I would also say to the family that we should look into, um, uh, and I believe they can find this information on our website, both the Farmers to Families Food Box Program, if they're able to access that, um, does have fresh vegetables, um, and meat in the box and, and dairy. And also the food bank has a, a veggie Van Gogh program mm. um, where we do fresh produce distributions around the state. And uh, there should be one in, in that family's area. You know, it's hard for me to say, but there just is not enough um, support out there for a lot of families. And um, we do what we can um, but really, it, what, what we need is a more about robust federal response. You know, as you said earlier, Anne, I said that the, the food bank is meant to fill in the, the gaps. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing our role right now being really being one of the sustaining providers of food to a lot of people in Vermont. Mm -hmm. It's really a tough issue. It's great that you're there to help uh, Vermonters get through this period. And um, I, uh, well, could I, could I yeah. jump add in something? I just wanted to say that for those who are, might think you might be eligible for Three Squares Vermont, but you're not sure, um, you can, uh, if you text VFBSNAP, so that's VFBSNAP, Vermont Food Bank SNAP, to 85511, it will, you can go through a little screening process. Um, and find out if you might be eligible, and then it'll connect you to resources to actually get help filling out an application. Um, or you can go to our website or hungerfreevermont.org um, and get information on how to find out if you're eligible. I really encourage people to do that. That's great. And so with this texting mechanism, you can find out without really formally filling out an application. That, that right. might be less intimidating for people to just sort of test it out, see if they, they qualify rather than going all in on a form maybe they don't feel so good about. Right, and it's, it's, um, it's actually, that's one of the issues. Um, and I think it was Peggy, her family has gone through this. It's a, it's a complicated application mm. um, and you have to provide a lot of information. Um, and uh, that's why we, we have people actually who will, who will get on the phone with you and, and go through the application and help you fill it out and take you through the process of, of submitting that to the state. And, and if you get confusing, uh, confusing information back, you can give us a call and we'll walk you through it. So we wanna make the process as easy as possible for people. What kind of information do you have to provide? Um, you have to provide uh, uh, your income information, um, including verification. You have to provide um, information about other assets. Um, do you have bank accounts? Do you have cars? Um, how many people live in your household? Who are those people? Do they have other income? Um, you know, how much do you pay for housing? Um, what's your heating bill? There's just, they, they use things to balance what, um, what the federal government wants to determine your need to be. So I talked about how you don't always get the maximum benefit mm. and they use all those, um, 
those different numbers to figure out what your benefit level will be. Mm. Wow. Well, John, I want to thank you. It, we were, our half hour went so fast. We knew that would happen because uh, you're just so knowledgeable on the subject. I want to thank you again for joining us for the third in a series of FAQ Live. And I want to thank um, our sponsors, uh, Garnet Health, which provides both rapid antigen and PCR COVID-19 testing for individuals and businesses seven days a week. Garnet also offers expanded testing, including flu AB for symptomatic clients. Schedule a test today at their new location next to Burlington International Airport by visiting www.garnet.care testing. John, thank you again. And I wanna encourage everyone to check out the Vermont Food Bank website. Um, we are contributing uh, meals uh, for every member, but it's not nearly enough. So um, please check out their website and do what you can to help help your neighbors. And thank you, Anne, and thank you for all your your readers and um, for the, your support of Vermont Food Bank and all the great reporting that VT Digger does for Vermont. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Have a good night. Thanks. Bye.